I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. We're back, baby! Uh, yeah, we're something. We are so something. So this is, this is the cursed episode, um, as Take I said three. before we started. Yeah, this is the third <laughs> time we're trying to record this episode, so... Uh, the feed's been pretty empty, uh, and if you follow the Discord, which there's a link in the show notes, you'll know why. Yeah, we had, uh, a Transformer explode once. Mm -hmm. We had you fail to get superpowers once. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay, so we don't know if I got bit by a tick or not. We don't know if I got bit by a tick or not. I am not Patrick Warburton yet. <laughs> okay, good. Yet. Oh, I well, might become Patrick Warburton. We don't you, know. You may very well be Patrick Warburton. Who is Patrick? Does he play the tick? Yeah. Okay. He also plays Kronk. Kronk? From uh, The Emperor's New Groove. Oh, that's Patrick Warburton? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Patrick Warburton. I'm going to feel real dumb if I got it wrong. Yeah, that's the guy. Squints McGee. Well, let's, let's, no. Okay. He was in B-Movie. He, I'm sure he, he was been, in a lot, a lot of stuff. He's, he's Joe Swanson on Family Guy as well. Yeah. Get Smart Emperor's New Groove B-Movie. Venture oh. Brothers. We, oh, jeez. I just, I just remembered something we should talk about after the show, but it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, can't, um, we can do that. It's it, it it involves everybody's favorite conspiracy theorist. Ah, I gotcha. Yeah. I'm catching what you're pitching, but not um, in that way. Gross. Back shots. Back shots? Taking back shots? <laughs> I'll explain um, what that is later. <laughs> I mean, oh. I have a guess, what? but what? I think what else happened in our in our in our in, in the time during a cursed episode? Oh, uh, the curse has spread it, to the house. By the way, has it? I my refrigerator broke. I had to get a new mm -hmm. refrigerator. My garage door broke. I had to pay some guy like three hundred dollars to fix a button, and he was only here for like thirty minutes. And I was like, "Come on, uh, that's it." Oh, I'm I'm on hair loss medication. We've yeah, all, we're all. I'm slowly dying. I mean, I, I'm, I'm more than slowly dying. To be fair, like <laughs> I'm, I'm dying at up. an excel. I was, I'm dying at an accelerated rate. Like, let's be real. Um, because like, like, I was at a hundred and three degrees. That's close. You, you could have. We could, we could have melted some cheese on you. Probably. I um just a giant I, covered in cheese. So I ended up in the hospital. Um and you know how they have like TVs in hospital rooms? Yes. Uh somebody had left Disney Channel on. No. So I was I was just watching Owl House because I I <laughs> actually like that show. And like I was just like it was muted, but I knew what was happening because I've already I already saw the episode. No. <laughs> you were living in a fever dream. It was it was so weird because it was just like oh no I know I know exactly what's happening on this show right now. Um, <laughs> there's no closed captioning, there's no audio, but I know what's happening. Uh, and then I switched over to to how it's made because. Uh, how it's made is basically the show that has saved my life more times than I can count. It's a very good show. Um, well, it's it's one of those shows that like so. When I was younger, uh, my parents, my mom, like went up to, like you know where the you know where that campaign. So remember when I ran Monster of the Week? 
Yes. And you remember how I, like, picked a random place in upstate New York? Yes. I accidentally picked one of my least favorite vacation, like, one of my least favorite places in upstate New York to have a vacation. <laughs> um, okay. Because, like, my mom had spent, like, a lot of the su- My mom and my sister spent most, like, a lot of the summer up there. And, like, I had no interest in going up there. Um, the best but, vacation spots where you don't care to be. So, like, what ended up happening was I just watched how it's made all day. Because, like, it was... There was nothing to do. There was nothing interesting to do in the house. I don't... And this is, like, pre, like, good consoles. So I just, yeah. like, like mo- mobile consoles. So I just, like... I watched how it's made for like a week straight. And I think I saw High School Musical 2 like five times. No. All right. Not because I wanted to. Oh. Not because I wanted to. I wasn't the one who chose to watch High School Musical 2, but I watched it. I hated it. Yeah, that's that's some kind of torture stuff. Oh, it was it Brandon, it was absolutely psychological torture for me. Like it's, I'm picturing you getting clockwork orange to uh, seeing high school musical 2 in a cabin in the that, woods. That that well there was also like a grave in front of the house too. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so it was it was it was like too. it was like my living it was like a living hell if I'm going to be completely honest with you. It sounds um, like it. Yeah, no, no, like like I hated it. I hated everything about it in every way, shape, and form. Um, because it's like super not the kind of stuff I'm interested in. I have no idea what my family was doing there, like at all. And it was like balls hot too. So There's, it was like one of those don't camp when hot. hot it wasn't even bad. camping. It wasn't even camping. It was in like a fucking house. What? Yeah, I don't I don't know. It was weird. Like it's one of those weird things that I can't explain. Don't be hot in house in woods. Yeah, like I don't know. I don't know, Brandon. <laughs> like it was confusing for me and like it was a conflicting time it was. in which I didn't It sounds I like you're describing hitting puberty. <laughs> basically. Uh, fuck. I don't even like I'm trying to even remember where the fuck this place was and like like I found it on accident when I was making a fucking I, well you showed it uh, to us on a map yeah yeah it was funny cause like I was like walking through it and I'm like wait a second wait a fucking second wait a fucking second and I was just like <laughs> god damn what have I done Cause like I was trying to go to like the middle of nowhere, New York. Yeah. Like there's literally a place. So like I'm okay. So I'm looking for it on Google Maps as we speak, and uh, I found a place in New York that's called Lake Desolation. That sounds metal as hell. <laughs> it sounds like hell. Uh, cause there's also Lake Desolation State Forest. The HOA requires you to wear black nail polish if you live there. There's a there's a there's the Pine Tree Lodge uh you can stay at, I guess. That, there's a Lake Desolation Road. Uh, I want to live on a cool named road now. That's awesome. I've got a Badger Conda drawing in my basement by the way. Yeah, well that was that was ripped directly from uh that was ripped from what you call it. Uh, John dies at the end. Was it? I'm not gonna lie. I'm 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 a bit of a a, a sneak thief in that regard. I don't remember a badger conda and John dies. It got co- so um, it got renamed into like a spider creature in the official release. In the original, oh, it was the the, the thing original, that was in like the in the corner of the guy's house on the ceiling. The thing, the thing that has the 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 parable of the axe, yeah, or Theseus' ship, like originally it was it was killing a badger conda, not like a weird spider looking creature. Oh, 
Oh, I in didn't the like that. first. Yeah, like in the first, like the web version, the version that got yeah. released for free, it was a Badger Conda. Huh. Um, so my first and only cryptid that I created for Monster of the Week was a Badger Conda, and then like you know, shit happened, and like that's when our D and D sessions like fell apart. Yeah. Pretty much. So, well, shit had happened before that, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> for uh, not this podcast or any podcast, really. It's, that's a little too personal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Anywho. Uh, so this is this is the third attempt at recording. Uh, this particular episode of Cryptopedia. Um, at, if you're a Patreon supporter, there's at least one attempt that you can listen to. That's just my voice. Uh, <laughs> but yep. this is Cryptopedia. Um, something, something, something about ghosts and monsters and legends that haunt human minds. Um, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And we're finally coming back to Mokila Membe Part 2. That's after right. Entitled, a month. If, you, if you're reading along, in, entitled Incoherent Screaming. Which is honestly a very appropriate... A very appropriate, like, name for this episode. Yes. Um, like, I call it John's... Ang- I actually called it John's Angriest Place. Yep. But, like, Incoherent Screaming is also very, very good for this. Um, so, Mokole Membe is back. And since it's been two months, <laughs> let me hit the high points of the story so far. Uh, oh. First, this story takes place in the Congo River Basin, uh, a location in sub-Saharan Central Africa, which, like most of Africa, was subdivided by various European countries, Belgium, France, and Portugal in this case. Uh, and against this backdrop, the first reported sighting by Europeans came from Carl Hagenbeck's 1909 book, Beasts and Men, a secondhand report that didn't even name the creature. The creature was then vaguely described as a sauropod-like Apatosaurus, and it wouldn't be named until 1913 at the earliest. Although I personally have no way of knowing if this was ever reported before Willie Lay's Exotic Animals, or in fact if it actually ever happened, uh, which I don't think it did. So was Beasts uh, and Men like the the 19th century version of uh, sorry 18th century version of the Monster Manual? Well, it would have been 20th century because it's 1909, but um, uh, I forgot. So it, it would have been that. it would have been the 20th century version of the 20th century monster manual that existed. Um, nice. Well, no, it's remember Carl Hagenbach was like the like he was the dude who ran zoos and like he had like uh, ethnography displays or whatever. All where, that like, really cool stuff. Yeah, like it was adjacent to the thing that we talked about last time with you with um Oofty Goofty. Uh, Oofty Goofty, yeah. So it's it's a whole thing. Um So I also read uh Abominable Science again, uh cuz I've had it in my library for a while and like I read this a month ago, so like my memory's a little rusty, so bear with me. Uh, And it turns out that Willie Lay was the translator of the original account by Von Stein, which was the 1913 account. And to my knowledge, no copies of it exist in the original German today. So, yeah. And last last time we did this, uh, we closed with an exploration of a Smithsonian expedition in 1919, which has been totally butchered by Mokile Membe supporters and an investigation on the source that I gathered the, the story from. Um, so from the discovery that, like, young Earth creationists are super involved in this story, I'm going to continue, basically. Uh, but but first, I want to wrap up some earlier sightings. Uh, there are a few more stories that I haven't covered in the history of Mokila Membe that don't explicitly deal with young Earth creationists, although, like, statistically speaking and time period speaking, there's probably a fair number of these people who are young earthers despite the fact that it's like not their whole personality there's i i I didn't forward it to you but i should have i'm trying to remember that i saw something online this week where there's more people pushing um current current 
living dinosaurs. I have to try to sc- scoop up the article again. It, it, it might not make it to an episode, but at least will do, let me make you feel some rage. Do I want to read that? Because, like, I feel like I'll just be sad if I read it. It's entirely possible you will just be like, sad. But you'll probably just be sad anyway, so it all works out. I mean, I'm sad most days. I'm on... I am on antidepressants, so, like... <laughs> <laughs> I am I am typically sad if we're going to be like like statistically speaking I'm probably sad. <laughs> like pick a day, I'm probably sad in some way shape or form. Um just because like, you know, brain chemistry. Yeah, you're slowly turning into Mr. Meeseeks. No, I'm I'm way past the point of turning into Mr. <laughs> Mr. Meeseeks. I I live that life. Um like that is that is me. Uh so what was I doing? Where was I? I I completely lost track. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to jump ahead to 1932 in which we have two discrete reports. Uh the first comes from an unnamed British scientist who has been reported as finding abnormally large footprints in the Lukula region and hearing a strange song as a European man in a jungle. Yeah, you're, you, you're, I think last time we stressed heavily, like, a European in a jungle in a different country, oh, all, yeah, yeah. all of the sounds will be the strange, uh, of the strange yes, type. Yes, every, every sound is, by definition... A strange sound to you. Yeah. They're all all novel. Every single they one are, of them. They are all new. They are all strange. Like, you are not... That is not your place. No. You are not from there. No. Um, everything, everything that you hear is strange to you. Yeah. Like, that being said, like, white people are very easily startled by sounds and places that they live, too. Yeah. Like, historically. Like, from my experiences. Like, sounds that they should recognize. Very easily startled by sounds that they should recognize, and also very easily startled by lacks of sounds, the lack of sounds that they're used to being around. Yeah, yeah. That was a thing. Like, um, when I moved out of Kingston the first time, like, the train not being there was weird. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, that train, that train, man. Like, if I'm elsewhere at night, and it's there's no like train, it it, it, it like it, I notice the lack of trains. Oh yeah, no, it at fucks some point you. in the night. Yeah, it like, really fucks weird. With you. I, like, there's just ambient sound that's not there that should be there, and uh-huh. like the ground also rumbles a little bit, and the, the ground's not rumbling a little bit every few hours. There's something up. Something's happening. Uh, so the second report of the creature that happened was not a train sighting, um, although it might have been. I don't know. Maybe was this the one with the with fucking trains? No, that was last week. Last yeah, last uh, week was the train incident. Well, last month, two yeah, months Jesus. ago. Yeah. Uh, so a second report of the creature was made by Ivan T. Sanderson, a British biologist and a founding figure of cryptozoology. Now, we're on episode 94 of this podcast, and I'm legitimately amazed that, like, neither of us have come across this individual yet, as he's the literal coiner of the term cryptozoology in the 19, like, 40s or 50s. Yeah, like, he's, he had to come up sometime. (laughs) Yeah, but, like, almost 100 episodes. I'm just surprised it took as many episodes as it did. Yeah. Also, another um, guy with a cool name. I'm all for putting middle initials back into people's names. I prefer not to have my middle initial in my name. But it's cool. It sounds fancy. No. It, it like, doesn't. you should be embroidered on a napkin. I don't want it, though. Like, like it, it doesn't work for my name. Like, it's not... It, it, mine is John F. Dunham. Like, John the F fucking is, Dunham. That's just the F is for fuck. You put the F in fucking. Fucking? In fucking. Yeah? That's yeah. what I put the F in? Yeah. I hated my middle name as a kid. 
like so much. Middle names are always awkward as a kid, and then there, except there's there's always that kid where you find out like the name you've been calling them for four years is, is their middle name. Is their middle name, and you never knew their first name to begin with. Yeah, yeah, that's, yes, yeah. that's always a fun one. It's such a weird thing. Like the people who have their nickname as their main name. That's yeah. so common. Like it's upsettingly common. Yeah. Um. Anywho. So, uh, Ivan T. Sanderson, um, tucking, trucking, Ivan trucking Sanderson. Uh, trucking. He made, he invented trucking and truck nuts. He invented truck nuts. There's actually a really, like, there's a dollop on that that's, like, oh, yeah. super involved. Yeah. There's a lot to, like, silicon truck nuts. A have large legal dispute happened a over truck huge nuts. one. That's, I think, still ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> which is the most fucked up part about it. Yeah. Um. So, allegedly, Iron T. Sanderson has a fairly prominent role in the Mokila Membe story, uh, with many sources on him calling him out explicitly in references to the sweet cryptid. However, in true Cryptopedia fashion... Most of the internet talks about this sighting and that he studied Mokila Membe. Pretty much nothing else. Um, I'm personally of the opinion that he is the person who entered the name Mokila Membe into the cultural zeitgeist. But I can't find any essays or articles dated before exotic animals, so this should be taken with a grain of salt. And I want to remind you, exotic animals came out in 1959. So... Either Mokila Membe first was named in 1932 or 1959. I don't think that there's any in between. Real small window there. Yeah. Uh, so in Sanderson's tale, he comes across a set of hippo-like tracks, which to me would be a hippo would be my first guess. But, you know, I'm not I'm not the father of cryptozoology. Um, if it walks it was, like a duck, it's Mokila Membe. It's a actually Howard the Duck. It's actually Howard the Duck. It's actually Howard the Duck. Um, have you have you watched any of Loki? I have. I'm all caught up to Loki. The first two episodes are great. The third episode's weird, but that's all I'm going to talk about because it's like spoilerific. Yeah, it's. I'm enjoying it. It is weird, but it's good. It's good. It's a decent show. I like. I like. I like uh, Hiddleston. The Hiddle. I like. The I'm more interested. The third episode is weird, and there's one piece of information that you learn in that episode that makes you go, oh, interesting. You're going to have to tell me what you think that piece of information is, but not here. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's like hyper spoilery, and that episode, like, just came out. Yes. Um, so uh, Sanderson was told that he uh, the, the footprints were made by the creature. Magule... M Mugbulu M Membe. Um and following this, he says he is said following this, he is said to have seen something too large to be swimming in the on the river to be a hippo. Now, in my research, this is reliably all I can find on Sanderson's encounter with Mokile Membe. Although there might be more in his collection of essays, which I couldn't find any copies of within a two hour drive of me, which I forgot to look into because I was violently ill. <laughs> um, so I didn't get a chance to look for m more of those copies. Uh, and uh, as a coda to Ivan Sanderson, the story about a 15-foot-tall penguin wandering the beaches shared by a listener like three months ago now, like two months ago now, Will Smith, Wiki Wiki Wild, as I said last time I did this, uh, <laughs> on our Facebook group was ultimately wholeheartedly believed by Sanderson. He totally believed that there was a 15-foot tall <sighs> penguin walking around beaches. Uh, yeah. That's a little on the nose for him. It, it's hilarious because the one of the founding fathers of cryptozoology was ultimately thwarted by a pair of lead penguin shoes. Yeah. Like, it totally, it totally destroyed his credibility. Like, Completely, once it came out. Because yeah. he was, like, super As in support it should. of it. It should. Oh, 100%. It should. Like, the fact that he was believing that there was a 15-foot-tall penguin walking around is, like, an oh, issue. Yeah, of the red flags, 
That one's a 15 foot tall penguin. <laughs> you want to know what a red flag is? What? What? Bo Burnham's new special. Oh, I I I, I enjoyed that. It was good. Yeah, it it. It reads pretty manifesto-y, though. Yeah. It, it reads pretty white guy manifesto. Yeah. Now, like, I'm not, I'm not, like, the music's hilarious. It's all fucking funny. But, like, Bo Burnham's not all right. No, I prefer Bo Burnham, Bur- because I liked, Bo Burnham was this, like, inverse parabola for me where it's like oh Bo Burnham he plays uh, music and he's a comedian it's funny and then there's a big dip in the middle for a few years for in, in my interest and then this brought that interest right back up because he seems like he was just locked in a closet with a camera yeah I, that's kind of what happened um also like he was so here's a thing like he didn't like grow up that terribly far away from us no. No, I didn't realize that until the special. Like, he's not that far away at all. No. Um, you want to go stalk him at Hannaford? He's in... I don't think I don't think they have Hannafords at, in Massachusetts. But want to go stalk him at Whole Foods? That we might be able to do. Or do they have That's shop possible. rights in Massachusetts? I don't know. They probably have it. They probably got them everywhere. It's so weird to me that there's like geographical Regional. boundaries of retail locations for stores that are all owned by the same parent company. Yeah. Yeah. It's confusing. It's confusing it and me. weird. And like this is like Carl's Jr. and Hardee's and like and all these and like well like every fa- all the fast food chains are owned by like the same one big it's just you weird that there's like regionally specific things that are identical to each other that it's like creating the illusion of competition is that yeah. what they're doing well that's that's the whole point it's to like make you think that there's competition that is a hundred percent the point like all it's these to make you think you have a choice it's like all these places joints now are coming out with like the the chicken sandwich battles and they're hyping up like all these different chicken sandwich th- like who's sandwich is better they're all the same company they're all the same company <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing that was happening. It's because beef prices are going up. So beef got more expensive. Oh. So they're they're to drive costs down, um, pushing chicken sandwiches harder. So they're creating the illusion of a chicken sandwich battle between all these businesses that are all owned by the same company. So, like, here's the thing. I- I'm kind of in support of chicken just becoming the primary protein over pork. I enjoy chicken. It's hard well, from a, shopping pork, for chicken beef. because, like, I like ethical food, but that's a little bit more expensive. Yeah, well, chicken's not going to be very ethical. No, not at all. I did, like, so the, the, the butcher shop done where, uh, by my parents' house is awesome because they do post-mortems on all their animals first, and they won't, they'll stop buying from a farmer if they find any bruising on an animal that happened oh. before the animal died. Because I guess if they can tell when bone fractures and bruising happened. Well, like, what if what if the animals are just fucking stupid? I mean, that could be a thing, too. Like, I'm I, I I'm not like supporting people abusing animals. I'm just saying, like, what if the animals just fucking stupid? It might be. I just get sad whenever I, when I when I cook a steak and it's bruised. I'm like, oh, poor steak. Poor steak. Poor steak. Not po- not poor cow. Not poor cow. Poor steak. No, I still have to dissociate the the food from the animal, or else I get real sad. That, that that's that's fair. <laughs> I do have to do that too. Um, all right. So getting back to Mokila Membe, uh, because knowing our luck, uh, I don't want to tempt fate too much by over talking, because we're just gonna end up fucking getting another transformer explosion. Um. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> if that happens, the podcast is just over. There were a lot of fireworks going around last night, so there's a, th- a chance that just a rogue firework will take out the power to my house. If 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 that happens, the universe doesn't want Cryptopedia to exist anymore. No. I will take down the site. <laughs> um. So while Mokila Membe is a holy 20th century cryptid, 
I do agree with the primary source that I used for this episode this week. Uh, Abominable Science, Origins of the Yeti, Nessie, and Other Famous Cryptids by Daniel Loxton. Uh, that the inflection point for modern star stories more or less starts with James Powell Jr. Uh, Powell was inspired by the work of Lay, Sanderson, and Helbelmans, who I didn't talk about because, honestly, it's just the same shit. They're another, like... Helbelmans is another person who's just, like, super prominent in early cryptozoology, but, like, his story is effectively identical to uh, Sanderson's. So there's, like, no point talking about it. Um, and James Powell Jr. decided to focus on the Von Stein account, which, once again, important to note, only Lay, to my knowledge, has seen the Promier document and is the only person who translated it from the original German. So we don't, even if it exists, we don't even know if it's an accurate translation. Oh, that's always good. Yeah. Uh, in 1972, Powell acquired a grant from the Exploration Fund of the Explorers Club to study crocodiles in the northern Congo region. Powell, however, was unable to get an entry visa to the People's Republic of Co Congo and instead explored the neighboring Cameroon in 1976 and Gabon in 1979, asking questions about Mokila Membe in an apparent diversion from his stated goals. Powell was a particularly credulous investigator, believing everything told to him at face value. Best uh, Powell, investigator ever. Yeah, I mean, like, that's most, like, ghost hunting things, too. Because, yeah. like, the number of ghost hunter videos where I see the person who's just like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's that makes sense. That tracks. That tracks. <laughs> and they, like, just yes and <laughs> fucking everything. Yeah, there's... <laughs> there's never a ghost hunter video where someone says, I have some further questions. I, I have uh I have doubts. Yeah. <laughs> it's not very rare. Very rare. Incredibly rare. Like non existent. Um So one account recalled by Abominable sci Science is particularly telling of the level of skepticism Pal simply lacked. Uh while traveling through Gabon in nineteen seventy six, Pal had met an informant who told him that he had never seen Mokila Membe. In, 1990, in 1979, however, the man had staked out the monster decades prior to see it emerge from the water. When Powell asked to be taken to the location of the beat's exit from the water, the man refused, apparently fearful of the location. Powell was entirely convinced, even saying if he were acting, then he ought to be in Hollywood picking up Academy Awards. Which feels incredibly dismissive of the local people and couched in at least a sizable he heaping of racism. Yeah. Th there's a little racism inherent in that. God. Car dealerships uh, must love this guy. Oh, 100%. He's, he pays sticker price every time, just like. He's uh, the reason Hank the Hill. upsell was created. The upsell? Yeah. Like, like whenever, like if you go to, for example, fast food chains, and you just want a hamburger. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. always make it a combo, and they never let you know that there's a small option for drinks. It's always do you want yeah. a medium or a large? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it costs nothing to produce drinks at fast food restaurants. That's where all the money is. Yeah, that's where you get the money. Drinks, that's where you and get I will money. continue my can campaign against Italian food. Because why? I know how much pasta costs. Why is it a twenty-six dollar plate of pasta? Why? It's sauce. The sauce don't cost that much either. I go to Hannaford. The sauce, but it's special. It's special made sauce. It's not special. It's probably from a jar. It's. Special. There's no way they're hand making. I don't it's know how many. It's not ragu. It's. Uh, no, I promise you, it's not ragu. Ugh. It might be ragu. Like it's the it's store bought pasta, probably store bought sauce. They're hand making the meatballs. That's you're paying so much money just for meatballs. And a lot of the time, you don't even necessarily get meatballs. Well, it's only like, if you get if the you pasta get, like, meatballs. You get like a chicken linguine or something like that. Yeah, I but mean, also I ch some... chicken cheap protein. Why is pasta that expensive? It sounds like the hill you want to die on. It's the, but I could I be wrong. Refuse to eat pasta at a restaurant. 
I will you also never refuse, do it. You refuse to eat steak at a restaurant, too, if my memory is correct. Yeah, it's the last time I went to an Italian restaurant, um, which was a few weeks ago. Um, I got split pea soup and a, and a margarita. Because <laughs> I knew the soup was homemade, and I wanted to try an Italian margarita. God damn it, Brandon. An it- so what is an Italian margarita? Is it any different than a regular one? It's just a regular Probably margarita, not. but it's made at a restaurant that has a, uh, an Italian-sounding name. <laughs> uh, of course. Yep. Um, what was it? There was another thing that reminds me. Um, I can't remember. Oh, well. I'm bad at I'm I I'm I've lost my I've lost my touch is all there is to it. If I ever had a touch or the power. Anywho, so um <laughs> during this time period, Pal befriends fellow monster hunter Roy McCall, and the two embark on an exploration for Mokila Membe in ni- in nineteen eighty. Now, I want to take an aside for Roy McCall. The man actually has a real CV with some first authors on moderately well-received papers, mainly dealing with virology. I should note that I'm also operating off of a modern understanding of publication impact, and my experience is in a non-biological field, so, like, you know. Regardless, the man is in fact a real PhD who contributed at least nominally important discoveries to the human understanding before he became a prominent cryptozoologist. Now, prior to his dealings with Powell, McCall had already done a fair amount of work on the Loch Ness Monster starting in the 1960s. McCall, having an actual PhD, made him an important figure in the field of crit- in, the, in cryptozoology as it led an air of credibility to the ho- horrifying pseudoscientific field. Now, as someone who is pursuing a PhD, uh, it is, this, this fact is totally valid, you know, because as everyone knows, getting a PhD just makes you an expert in everything and not specialized in one thing. It's just like being an engineer. If you're an engineer, you can do anything. Absolutely And you know everything. And there's no specialization at all. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. If you're you're like an electrical engineer, you know everything about the human body. Like, it's just facts. I'm not a doctor, but I can run electrical software. Yeah, like, like really, like, that's a fact. Like, if you, if you're in, if you're looking to, to find a new career, why not try engineering? Yeah. You just get a hyperinflated sense of self-worth. Yeah. And I say that as somebody who is a soft who had an official title as an advisory software engineer. Bones and schematics are the same thing. Basically. Basically. I mean, you should be talking about like the eff- efficacy of vaccines if you have a uh, if you have a computer science degree, you can talk about the efficacy of vaccines perfectly. You fully understand it and, like, completely, like, 110% get it. That's right. Mm-hmm. 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 Also, you know everything about politics. You should become a politician. There's... Y- you should just... You, the, wor- the world is your oyster as a... Uh, as a, <laughs> as an engineer. Particularly if you're white. Yeah. I don't like oysters. Neither do I. I don't like bivalves. Yeah. Like, I just, I don't like, I don't like the idea of it. It's, like, creepy to me, because, like, you're effectively, uh, they're too close to the thing that they are, right? Like, yeah. I need, I need that, la- like, layer of suspension of disbelief. It's also weird to eat an entire animal in one bite. I mean, shrimp. Oh, yeah, shrimp. But shrimp are delicious, so, like, that's a whole... Like, shrimp are my exception to the rule of eating things that are close to what they originally look like. Yeah. But I also have to have them de-veined and de-shelled, because that, that's too close. Yeah, and cut the heads off. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, we, that's too close. We need to fully transform... <laughs> we, the, I can't eat food unless it's been hor- horrifically dismembered. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, I can't, I can't, like, like, I hate, like, rotisserie chickens because it's too close. Yeah. Like, Thanksgiving turkey is borderline too close for me. So you're you're one of those people, like, you need to have that all pre-cut and served on the plate. 
I need that suspension of disbelief. Of yeah. I need that suspension of disbelief. Like, if I can't recognize where this came from, I'm fine. It the ha- second that I start to realize where it came from, I'm just like, nah, I hate this. This is awful. I feel terrible. Yeah. That's pretty much it. I just feel, like, ashamed. Yeah, it has to, it has to look closer to a sandwich than an animal. Pretty much, yeah. 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 I, I'd stop eating meat entirely if I didn't enjoy the taste so much. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. Yeah. And also because it's, like, sometimes cheaper to eat meat. There's than, really like, good um, uh, uh, it's, vegan it's stuff. It's becoming... It's the, becoming easier. The, it's uh, becoming easier. The thing you have to watch out is the salt content, because some of those are high in sodium. But the yeah. um, the Morningstar uh, vegan ground beef tastes better than real ground beef. Hmm. So there's some... some uh, I prefer it in some cases. In other cases, it's a fine substitute. Sausages. It's better on nachos, that ground beef. Uh, vegan meatballs are better. Um, still nothing beats a... Good old chicken wing. That's fair. So, regardless of all these statements about the uh, intelligence of engineers and PhDs, uh, Powell and McCall... <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> Powell and McCall <laughs> ventured into the Republic of Congo together in hopes of finding one of the more unconvincing cryptids we've covered on Cryptopedia. Um one of the major stories explored by Pal McCall on their venture was a famous tale of Mokila Membe being killed and eaten at a difficult-to-access Lake Tele in 1959. McCall and Powell first heard of this story in the Congo, hearing a vague rumor which a Mo- in which a Mokila Membe was killed at Lake Tele. The rumor evolved to be an anecdote a soldier's wife had heard, and then eventually the blame was placed on a local official. The events... The investigation eventually led them to question <laughs> President Kongola Uh-oh. of the Kola region. Uh, no, this is happening again. Epena district. This can't be happening again. Kolonga asserted John's that Mokila Membe. Oh, we're good. Oh, okay. Uh, Kongola, uh, I, I, yeah, we have some connectivity issues. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Kolonga asserted that Mokila Membe actually no. means. What is happening? All right, we're going to have to take it from the top on this. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Okay, we're going to take it from the top on this particular story. Okay? Yeah. So, this is so scary. I don't know. This is Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, to be fair, I also have I also have a no. battery backup as opposed to you. Yeah, I should have lugged my battery back up from the basement like like, my, my computer is a laptop that I'm using to record oh. this. So, like, if I lose power, it's not the end of the world. See, my UPS is connected to my, my laptop downstairs and my 3D printer because I'm afraid of losing prints. God damn it. <laughs> um, okay, so McCall and Powell. I like how I switched up Powell and McCall and McCall and Powell. Anywho, uh... <laughs> First heard of this story in the Congo, hearing a vague rumor in which a Mokili Membe was killed at Lake Tele. This rumor evolved into an anecdote by a soldier's wife, uh, and it eventually led to a local official. Their investigation led resulted in them questioning President Kolonga of the Kola region's Apena district. Kolonga asserted that Mokili Membe actually means rainbow, as opposed to... Uh, Thing that stops waters or whatever the fuck it was, uh, and that the pair were mistaken. Mikhail then promptly argued with Kolonga and said one of the most like are that happened things I've probably ever heard. <laughs> we have several times over, uh, we have heard several times over that a Mokili Membe was killed sometime in the past in Lake Tele. We have heard, too, that this Mokile Membe is very dangerous, although its food is strictly vegetable material. The Malumbo is its favorite food. If your people, or rather the natives at Lake Tele, are able to kill a rainbow with spears, and that rainbow eats Malumbo fruit, we are very interested. I'd like to see your manager. <laughs> now, uh. honestly, I, like, fully doubt that this dude said that, because it just... It, like, it sounds too packed, yeah. right? Like, it sounds too, like, mm. 
like this is the perfect answer to his like I'm so clever, right? Yeah. I don't believe that I really don't believe that Mikhail is that clever of an individual because like he's wasted so much time researching Loch Ness monster and uh Mokile Membe that like I just my perception of his like level of relative intelligence is like tarnished to say the least <laughs> yes um i do however believe that he told Col- Kalunga the story as he knew it at this point which is exactly how you get falsified testimony because supposedly the next day Kalunga was willing to provide them with the truth about mokila membe oh good at this point they passed his test yeah, so at this point, my hypothesis that Mokila Membe is just a prank played on explorers uh, gets a bit of circumstantial evidence. Because, uh, yeah, Powell believed that they had gained the man's confidence and convinced him uh, that he and Macau were not laughing at the traditions of his people. Keep in mind, multiple people at this point in the story have discounted Mokila Membe in Powell's journeys in this region alone. However, this person was finally the one saw, who saw that they were on the up and up and he would spill the tea. <laughs> Seems reasonable. Mm-hmm. Kalunga arranged for the two intrepid explorers to meet with two informants, Mateka Pascal and an unnamed fisherman who both recounted hearsay about the story. Mateka did not personally see the animal as he was only a small child at the time. According to his account, the Mokila Membe had been entering Lake Tille from the Moliba, which I think is river, in which it lived via one of the waterways which entered the lake on the, we- lake on the western side. After the animal entered the lake, the natives had blocked off its waterway by constructing a barricade of large stakes across it. When the Mokila Membe had tried to return to its Moliba, it was trapped by the barricade and killed with spears. Some of the stakes used to construct the trap were large tree trunks and are still there. The natives cut up the animal and ate it. All who ate it died. The animal killed is said to be one of two. The other, possibly a mate, is said to still be there, but has become wary and difficult to approach. So, uh, something that I realized reading this, like, third time... Mm -hmm. Um... If I'm reading this correctly... Mokile Membe entered the lake. Then they built a barricade behind it out of large tree trunks. Yes. And then they attacked it. Yes. Like, so did Mokile Membe just wait for them? Oh, well, it's just sitting there watching them build its own prison. Like, yeah, like, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. What you doing there? Huh. Interesting. Huh. Also, that implies that there's only one way to get in and out of a lake yeah it does like it does i'm sure over over its entire shoreline that there's probably a spot that it could get out also remember that mokile membe is like so the way mokile membe is described is like an apatosaurus so it has legs yeah like it can walk yeah it can walk right like it can walk on land. Yeah, it should be able to just walk out of the lake. <laughs> yes. Yes. It should be like, so, look at you nerds building a trap, walk away. Yeah, just walk, like, you know, up the bank and be like, fuck you. Yeah. Um, so, naturally, this story is structurally identical to what the two men had told Kalonga the night before. <laughs> Although, it gained those wonderful flourishes that cryptid stories are well known for. Everyone who ate the meat dies, removing the chance of there being a first-hand source, uh, as there is no apparent reason that the group had hunted Mokila Membe. Uh, there is no reason... Oh, yeah, I can't read. Um, <laughs> now, like, like, there's literally no reason for them to have been hunting this whatsoever, because, like, yeah. there's no talk about it being a food source. There's no t- talk about it having been terrorizing things. And, like, there's the fact that there's two Mokile Membe. Why didn't they kill the other one? Why did they yeah. just stop at killing the first one? Like, if they were trying to kill it for, like, protective reason, like, because it's a threat, why would they leave one alive? Yeah, but it wouldn't be a threat because it's, it's, 
it, it, it it's not carnivorous. Yes, yes, it's it's not carnivorous. Yeah. So like, why, why, whatever. Uh, so the the fisherman then adds a flourish, saying that he heard one person survived and didn't eat the meat, but he died ten years ago, which seals the the story completely in hearsay. Uh so that being said, there is one thing that could be confirmed about the story. The storyteller affirmed that the stakes were still there, and he knew where it was because he fished there. Unfortunately, however, Powell and Macal's visit visas were about to expire, so they left the region without verifying. And despite Macal coming back the following year, the story remains unverified to this day. Perfect. And it had, like, a very clear verification point. Like, the path to verify that story, not difficult. No. Like, not difficult. Yeah. Um, so, as a pop cultural aside, this story has been deeply enmeshed in the lore of Mokila Membe since, like, it entered, like, uh, since Mikhail reported on it. And it was, in fact, used as a plot point in the 1985 film Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend. The film was produced by Walt Disney Studios and released on the Touch film, Touchstone Films label uh, and was later recut into Dinosaur, dot, 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 Secret of the Lost Legend for television releases. In the movie, a family of Mokile Membe is found by a married team of paleontologists. Uh, the Congo River Basin, while it is... While it has fossils, it's not exactly the place that I would look for them. Uh, because it's, like, still geologically active in terms of forming sediment, as we mentioned in the last episode. And, like, it's not super easy to dig in the Congo because it's, like, a lot of wet. Yeah. It's a lot of wet. Like, a lot of the time when you're searching for, like, fossils, you're looking in places that are super dry. Like the Badlands, or like you know. yeah, there's the, a reason why most pictures you find of archaeological um, digs aren't like they're all dry. They're like, yeah, they're like all in the desert. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's easier to dig fossils. Yeah, in the desert, and like also because like usually the desert is like where a sea used to be, or like. You know, there's sedimentary rock of some kind. Like, there's places that you can look for the for fossils that make more sense than the Congo River Basin. So, yeah. it's a movie, but still, there, there's, like, no good reason for the paleontologist to be there, in my opinion. Um, in typical 80s movie fashion, the creature is gentle and not feared by the other animals. An evil scientist in the military then appear to capture the creatures for fame and fortune and to kill them, respectively. In the course of events, one of the parents is killed in a manner similar to the 1959 Lake Tele incident, and the other is captured. Long story short, the quote-unquote good guys win and release the creature back into the wild. The movie didn't do well with critics, clocking in at an underwhelming 13% on Rotten Tomatoes, with two of my favorite poll quotes being, Baby's faintly reptilian eyes are dead, and with them dies a lot of our belief. <laughs> from Sheila Benson at the Los Angeles Times with a 2 out of 5 review. Likewise, Mary Mahoney of the Austin Chronicles 0 out of 5 review pulls no punches. Even if your children like dinosaurs, don't let them be exposed to the offensive, insensitive, intolerably anti-humanist, and racist propagandizing that is draped around this film. No plot, no heart, no soul. We'll loop back to the racism in, in a bit, but... If you haven't guessed it, the uh, film kills a lot of black people. While the light, white leads are, uh, you know, mostly unharmed. Because, you know. Because Disney. Because racism. Yes. Um. So the other thing, too, about this story is, like, the... <laughs> the Brandon just picked the cat up by the tail. She likes it. I know, but like it's it's still startling to see, uh, <laughs> and it, it's it sends me off my thing. Um, so the other thing about this movie is like the good guy scientists mm -hmm. like are indistinguishable from the bad guy scientists, 
right? Because, like, the bad guy scientists are just, you know... The bad guy scientists want to take the Mokila Membe out and, like, you know, fucking do shit with them. And the good yeah. guy scientists want to take the Mokila Membe out and do shit with them. <laughs> so, like, there's literally no reason that they're any different. Like, it's they're just like, same. I'm... I'm I'm evil for the sake of being evil, whereas you're good because you're good and you're like whatever. The difference is one has a mustache to twirl. Basically, basically. Um, so returning to McCall's second expedition carried out without Powell, uh, he reports that in multiple instances, local Africans denied knowing anything about Mokila Membe or explicitly saying it didn't exist. However, McHale refused to accept this, as he was the one operating from the assumption that the Lake Tele incident was, in fact, incontrovertible. Uh, Like, just, it happened. It definitely happened. There's no chance that it was a fabrication. Uh, Once again, jumping to the notion that locals were lying to him. He really, really thought that local people were lying to him for some reason. I I don't get it. Um, Macau was in fact downright hostile with the locals, believing that the people of Moguma Bai were hiding information about Mokili Membe. Eventually, some of the villagers offered some stories that confirmed uh, what Ma- Ma- Macau had offered, but it should be noted that he had been giving the villagers beer backed by a <laughs> colony's security detail that had been armed by eight with AK 47s, so the testimony might have been. Slightly coerced. Yeah. It's Macau is old- possible. Yeah, a little bit. It sounds a little <laughs> coerced, right? Like, I don't know. If if there's like a mil if there's a security detail holding AK forty sevens and they're handing out beer, like I'd be a little wary of them. Yeah, do you Yes, so you could have beer or also I have an AK forty seven. What yeah. like the it's yeah, huh. yeah, yeah. They're they're it's a little bit uh blatant. Um, Macau is ultimately an asshole, as, you know, it doesn't take context. You, you can figure that one out with the context clues. Yeah. Um, saying these people did not deserve our medical lard guests in response to the party leaving medical supplies that the village desperately needed. Once again, village needed medical supplies. So, like... Yeah. Uh, this anecdote also points to a very important aspect of this story and many stories like it. People will tell explorers what they want to hear because they can very much benefit from being on the good side of these explorers, right? Um, Native people and explorers inherently have different needs. A native village or a town might need resources or money that comes from the explorer. Meanwhile, the explorer is typically seeking fame or at the very least recognition. To the explorer, uh, they have nothing to gain refers to notoriety and fame, which in itself is a bit fucked up. Right, um, because it erases the locals from their own stories that are like intrinsically tied to them, and at its core, it's an issue of not understanding that other people, in fact, have their own needs. There's no other people. Well, like, like it's a fucked up thing, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, there's an inherent just like fucktitude to it. There's, I like, like that new word, fucktitude. Yeah, it's got some fucktitude. It's got some fucktitude to it. You okay? I got a cat scratching. A cat okay. scratching. Hi, Dakota. Oh, we got a kitty cat. Look at that. The two of us got a little Sorry, kitty cat. I got, I got distracted. Hey, buddy. Oh. It's a little angry devil cat. And he's already left. Snaggletooth. All right. So at this <laughs> point, we t- we had a we had a cat intermission. I'm sorry. Um, at this point, uh, Will and so there is no legitimate evidence pointing to Mokila and Mepe existing, which you know, like, is obvious. It's it's all anecdotal. Like, there's no like anything. Um. Plaster casts are literally nothing. Like, like, literally nothing. They look like nothing. They're just like blobs. Um, there's a handful of video and photos that are promised, but they're all absolutely worthless for identification. 
However, at this point, William Gibbons enters the story. All and I fucking hate this dude. I'd hate this dude so goddamn much. He boils my goddamn blood. So I can't find a definitive or even basic biography on William J. Gibbons outside of the fact that he's a creationist from Scotland. Uh, he enters the story in 1985 to, uh, in a 1985 to 1986 expedition that he dubbed Operation Congo. <laughs> the expedition offered no new information on Mokila Membe, although pro-creationist sources seem to indicate that they discovered a new subspecies of Cerocibus galerius. So it's a type of monkey, I believe, if my memory is correct. Yes. I do uh, I think it's, been, it's a little monkey. Yeah, it's like a it's an old world monkey, if my yeah. memory is correct. A tiny monk. Um yeah, it's it's you know, it's a little guy. No, it's a cute it's little a tiny little monk. monk. It's a white monk. Um tiny yeah, little white he's monk. He's got white he's got white fur. And now while it does appear that uh Cerocobibus Sanjay a, a Cerocobibus Sanjay subspecies was in fact found in 1986. As far as I can tell, the individual who found it has no affiliation with the Operation Congo like mission. I I can't find like a definitive link between the person who discovered it and him, like oh, the good. Operation Congo story. So like I don't know, right? Like it might have the dude might have been there, maybe, but it like also doesn't seem like he was there. Um Gibbons then returned in 1992 in an expedition that he dubbed Operation Congo 2. I like his naming scheme. It's at least consistent. It is consistent. And Brandon, I shit you not, this was funded by Mick Jagger and Ringo Starr. The two people you think of most when I think expedition, I yes. think Ringo Starr. Yeah, uh, apparently there were other musicians who also supported it, I guess. Like, But those are like the two big names that are attached to it. Um, and this trip was less about finding evidence of Mokila Membe by most accounts and was instead largely a missionary trip, which is also another thing where I don't associate Mick Jagger with missionary trips. That's weird, because I do. You do? Yeah. Really? No. No. <laughs> okay, I was about to say, I'm like, I'm like, Mick Jagger? I feel like that's a no. I'm thinking of a um, different Mick Jagger. <laughs> You're thinking of a different Mick Jagger? It's a different Mick Jagger. What? Who's the Mick Jagger that you're thinking of? Like. there, There's like, a, a Mick Jagger out of Utah who runs like. A fairly decently sized like recruiting place for like uh, like missionary trips. They don't usually go like overseas, but they do like send people to other states. I don't believe you for a fucking second. You shouldn't, because I just made that up. Yeah, I Brandon, I'm I I have known you for like bordering on two decades now, <laughs> <laughs> and like I just don't believe you when you say shit like that. You can smell my bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, your, your bullshit's real easy to pick up for me. <laughs> um, so the party distributed supplies and medical treatments while also proselytizing about Christian gospel. At this point, the story takes on shades of the rope in, as Gibbon's behavior is somewhat comparable to Whitcomb's. And I want to point out again, as I mentioned in the rope in, I fucking hate this type of proselytizing. Because in my mind, it creates a power imbalance between the evangelist and evangelist. Gibbons is offering what might see needed supplies, and in doing so, he creates a captive audience, and he who are forced to listen to his story. And while it might seem peaceful, it's a subversive act that really robs people of their philosophical agency in some ways, because like you're producing this power dynamic in which there's a person who has the resources, who's basically pitching a philosophy to you, right? And then there's you who needs those resources and getting those resources is kind of predicated on making this person happy. It's the same thing that happened with the fucking what I was talking about before with like, you know, oh, they have nothing to gain. Right. Yeah. Like it's the same thing. It's like, yeah, you're basically forcing a religion on these people for with food. Yeah. The, right. The, you're the, buying. There's a good reason why when it 
uh, very recently, that guy was shot by a bunch of arrows. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I didn't see anybody defending his that person. <laughs> Everyone was like, the, yeah, yeah, you kind of got, that's what you get. <laughs> well, everyone told him that he was going to be killed. Yeah. Everyone told that man he was going to die. And, like, then he was basically a biohazard on an island of people who don't have immune... They don't have an immune response to, like, the diseases of the modern world. Yeah. So, like, he, he's like, he was like a literal biological weapon against that island. Yeah. Piece of shit. Well, you remember the, the second commandment was, Thou shall spread disease in my name. That's a fact. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the lost, uh, the lost commandments. Yeah. Yeah, it's from the original tablets. I thought you were gonna make a joke about no, that. No, I, 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 my, 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 the hamster was running on the wheel, but yeah, nothing, yeah. There, there, nothing came of it. <laughs> Anywho, so uh, supposedly on this adventurer, fellow explorer Rory Nugent captured a picture of the beast head, but the image is far too blurry. It could literally be anything. Actually, as I anything. Have. It literally could be anything. Like, that's not even a joke. It, like, I'm not even confident that that's water. It looks more like a knight, like the chess piece, in, like, a sink than it does Basically. anything else. Or, like, on top of, uh, on top of, like, marble. Yeah. Like a knight on marble, it almost looks like. That's, like, melted a little. I don't know. Um, so... Gibbons is easily the most frequent visitor to the region in search of Mokila Membe, as in addition to these two exp expeditions, he went another three times in 2000, 2003, and 2009 with Monster Quest. Our all good these old expeditions, mm -hmm, all these expeditions are exceedingly underwhelming, with the 2000 and 2003 ones being funded by creationist groups. According to a credulous wiki, wiki Gibbons apparently gathered first-hand accounts of the Mokila Membe activity from 1986 to 2000. These accounts included a description of a set of dermal spikes on the creature, which was only identified by paleontologists in 1991. Considering that these interviews happened after 1991, uh, it's fair to assume that uh, maybe some of these people learned that there was, that was a thing that people were describing as an aspect of sauropods. Uh, and, like, it doesn't indicate knowledge that predates science because the knowledge wasn't gathered before science found it. It was gathered after the fact. So, yeah. like, um, maybe shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you know, also remember prior to this point, none of the stories had stories about, like, dermal no, spines. None of them. Like, whatsoever. None of them. And, in fact, the picture from, uh, uh, from Rory Nugent doesn't have any dermal spines on it. So, you know, Cool. Uh, <laughs> it does look Gibbons, like it's wearing a cool ascot. A little bit. Well, the drawing does. Yeah. The drawing looks more like a cool ass about ascot. The picture looks like nothing. Um, <laughs> apparently, also during like one of these expeditions, uh, Gibbons heard a story about a triceratops-like dinosaur, but I literally can't find any other records of it past the account that I found. Like, the, like, one, like, one story that he talked about. Like, yeah. that's it. There's nothing else. Uh, on the 2003 expedition, funded by Milt Marcy, American insurance broker, and, you guessed it, creationist, uh, Gibbons heard stories about giant spiders, which really proves to me that the locals were fucking with him, as the spiders were described as five feet long, and because spiders are, uh, are, they have exoskeletons... Yeah. They literally couldn't exist. But, like, explain the square law. Explain Aragog. Couldn't exist. That's the, fantasy. If Aragog That's doesn't exist, then how, they, then how, if Aragog couldn't exist, then how'd they get him on the camera? I mean, it's a good point. I can't argue that. I mean, he also wouldn't be able to breathe because, like, the way that spiders breathe is through their skin. So, like, like he wouldn't be able to exist. <laughs> way to ruin my Harry Potter fantasy. I want to ride an Aragog. Is Aragog from Harry Potter? I'm now thinking of a different spider, I think. Oh, Aragog's the big spider in Harry Potter. 
Yeah, you're right. You're right. His venom's very useful in poison in potions. Oh, good. <laughs> Just thought you should know that. <laughs> also, the Aragog from Harry Potter. Like, I'm looking at the picture because I haven't seen that movie in a while. Uh, it's very clearly like a model. Oh yeah. Um, Which it like okay. it doesn't look like all weird and in like old uh 3D. Well, some I of them. Watch. There's there are other there are other ones where like, that scene doesn't actually hold up. They had a model I Aragog, but then they had a 3D Aragog, and that one yeah, done yeah. not so much. I, I can't really watch the Harry Potter movies anymore. If I'm gonna be completely honest with you, because they make you feel old. No, because. Uh, uh, J.K. Rowling is a thing, and like people being obsessed with them is a thing. Uh, yeah, like that kind of killed Harry Potter for me. Is how obsessed people were about it. Like I remember in high school when people would like drop Harry Potter trivia, and I'd just be like, "How the fuck do you know that?" It's still kind of weird that the church was like way anti Harry Potter. And yeah, but they're anti everything that yeah. has. Like it, it's it. It was just it, the problem was it was super popular, and like, it's like it's like the Beatles are bigger than Jesus or Mario. The Beatles were not bigger than Mario. They kind of were. Um. So once again, this trip included proselytizing, as you know, whatever. And this time, it featured a Cameroonian pastor, Nini, the pastor was a dramatic one as he not only cast out spirits from locals but also made a propagation on their last day on the river that it would be the day that they found the monster not sticking skipping a beat later that day he stood up on the canoe and declared a very big animal is crossing the river just ahead of us the pastor then followed up with a description they probably heard from the team earlier nobody saw fucking anything it's because their eyes weren't trained for it man that you gotta trust the pastor he re it was really there in 2004, another creationist team, once again funded by Milt Marcy, headed by Peter Beach and Brian Sass, How much to money the does monster. Milt Marcy have? Because, like, expeditions can't be cheap. I can get that, um... Like, he's Mick Jagger broker. has the money to send a group of people out to do that. But he's an insurance bro. That, 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 to me, doesn't sound like a big... He probably doesn't pay out, ever. Oh. Uh, like, 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 like most insurance companies. They don't yeah. pay out. So they just, like, cackle maniacally with all the money. Yeah. Um, so, like, that's my guess. He's also a creationist, and, like, they do weird shit with their money as well. Like True. Like, really weird shit. So, like... Like, build arcs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a, a display with Adam and Eve and a fucking Velociraptor. Yeah. And an Achillosaurus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on this expedition, Peter Beach and Brian Sass returned, uh, went to seek the monster. Uh, they took plaster casts of supposed claw marks, which they simply weren't, and devised a new hypothesis that Mokila Membe sealed itself up in river banks for long periods of time. There is literally no reason to believe this. There is no evidence of this, and they have never found a specimen that has done this. Like, there's no reason for them to hypothesize this, like, whatsoever. They're, like, they're turning the lack of evidence itself into evidence. Well, lack of evidence... Uh, what is it? A lack of evidence is not evidence of absence. What's that whole fucking boondocks thing? Oh, yeah. Where the dude, like, goes on a rant. Yeah. And it's just like, I, I think I'm following what you're saying, but, like, I don't get it at all. <laughs> that's basically... That's basically what this is to me. Yeah. Um. Moreover, on this expedition... While examining a hole that was supposedly housing a Mokile Membe, they heard a distinctive scraping sound as though something were attempting to claw its way out of the sealed chamber. The fearless explorers promptly fled the scene in response. There's, what were they expecting? Like, if you're expecting to find a bagel monster thing, then why would you run? Like, that was your goal the whole time. I, I don't fucking know, dude. I don't know. Like, they're dumb. They're dumb. Yeah. Marcy then would go himself in 2006 and find literally nothing. Oh, good. 
Uh, following this, Destination Truth would then visit in 2008, determining that the creature was a myth. And the last expedition, as far as I can tell, was for Monster Quest, which features Gibbons as an explorer on the show. Once again, the expedition yielded nothing, although they did poke sticks into holes to explore Beach and Sass's hypothesis. Oh, good. And uh, mm -hmm. good on Destination Truth for just for once being, being like, like nah dude. nah 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 this is even too much for us this is yeah. some bullshit if it's too much for destination truth that's it's saying bullshit. something yeah like like if they're like no you know that it's nah yeah so they're like we're the guys and we're the, and we're saying nah yeah now i did skip over a handful of expeditions they're mostly creationists but there's, like, a weird number of, like, Japanese-led expeditions. Like, I don't know why, but there's, like, four or five Japanese-led expeditions. Huh. Um, but the pa pattern is largely the same. Foreigner visits the region. People don't want to talk. People suddenly talk. No evidence is found. And sometimes there's bad photos, but that's really it. Uh, there was also, like, a BBC and Discovery Channel, like, expedition that happened. And they were just, like, there's not enough evidence anything here to be anything so they like deleted all the footage and just didn't bother okay they didn't just make, make it up <laughs> yeah it was it was like there was so little for them that they just were just like yeah no we're not gonna do this but they put <laughs> like out, imagine they put out the same places they put out documentaries on mermaids and dragons it was like yeah no, like there's not like, enough for this like there's not enough there's not <laughs> enough like, imagine that. That's, yeah. So, yeah. Now, as far as I can tell, most cryptozoologists don't believe in Mokila Membe. Even by cryptid standards, it's really fucking hard to believe. Especially considering high-fidelity satellite images exist that can see even herds of elephants. A larger sau sauropod, and I want to remind you, sauropods actually prefer dry land, should be trivial to find. No, it seems that Mokile Membe, much like the Ropin, is largely kept alive by younger creationists such as William Gibbons. And their reasoning is not a closely guarded secret. Gibbons and Kent Havanid and other creationists explicitly noted in their book on cryptozoology that they hoped their work would inspire a new generation of godly Christian explorers who will endeavor to venture forth to find and present these amazing mysteries of creation to an unbelieving world. So, like... At, at the very least, they're not hiding anything, but, like, yeah. they're very, very forefront with it. Yeah. And I should also note that young Earth creationists are biblical literalists, meaning they literally believe everything in the Bible happened exactly just as described. And, yes, that includes countless instances of incest. Yeah. This is... This is fucking lunacy because carbon-14 decay alone disproves biblical literacism, literalism. Um, yet, biblical literists mainly target the theory of evolution as the boogeyman that must overcome, be overcome for their belief. Um, because, you know, whatever. <laughs> Even though, like, if they found a rope in or a mokile membe, it would do fucking nothing to disprove evolution because the descriptions of these creatures are completely antithetical to our modern understanding of what these sauropods or, you know, pterodactyls, pterodons would look like because it would, in fact, indicate that the creature had evolved from its original, like, appearance. Yeah, I'm just going to say, at least for them, like, it's harder to wage a war against carbon than it is. Like, dinosaurs are cool. Yeah, but, like, even, not even carbon, just, like, geological activity alone. And, like, trees, yeah. Like, kind of, like, like, there's just so much stuff that, like, disproves biblical literism. Like, it's, it's not even funny, really. It's just depressing. Yeah. Like, I, I don't get <laughs> that's how I you can tell we're past the halfway point <laughs> I just don't get it I don't get it and like I want to also point out like now I want to talk about the coelacanth which actually I recently read an article our understanding of the age of coelacanths is wrong like aging them and like they're closer to extinction they're more endangered than we thought uh, because like we were calculating their ages wrong or something oh. like that but regardless um, 
So the coelacanth did nothing to harm the theory of evolution as a no. sci- established scientific theory. Um, and I want to point out, scientific theory does not mean it's a hypothesis. Scientific theory is a very, very specific term. Right? Yeah. Like, 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 the word theory uh, gets used incredibly incorrectly. Because incorrectly. Um, a theory is something that has a fuck ton of evidence support. A law is an axiom. Yeah. Like, meaning that, like, like you, you literally, it, like, it just is a fact. The word a theory is an explanation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an explanation that also has, like, substantial amounts of evidence. Yes. Um, whereas the word theory for people being used um, from, like, the way, like, Gibbons would use it, they would use the word theory to, at the same time, discredit evolution and, at the same time, give more foundation under their... Uh, bullshit ideas. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. Exactly. I wouldn't say hypothesis. But well, I'll say bullshit. It's not ideas. even a hypothesis. It's yeah. not even a hypothesis. Yeah. Um. So Gibbons and other creationists typically point to this fish, which was discovered living in 1938, citing incorrect facts such as it had been extinct for 200 million years. It was a foundational species for fish becoming amphibians, and that it should be extinct since foundation species are su- not supposed to continue surviving past their progeny. All of these points are fucking wrong. First, the coelacanth had fossils as young as 20 to 5 million years, so Gibbons should first fucking check his facts. Next, the coelacanth is not a foundational species, which is not even the correct use of the term. Foundational species have a major role in structuring community of living organisms, such as kelp in the kelp forests. Um... (laughs) Trees in a forest would also potentially be considered a financially foundational species. And I'm going to be generous and assume that Gibbons meant a common ancestor, uh, which is wildly different. In fact, the coelacanth is a lobed fish that lived alongside early relatives of amphibians and lungfish in the late Devonian period, meaning it represents an entirely separate branch of evolution entirely. Moreover, the existence of descendants of a species does not require the base species to be extinct. As Daniel Loxton notes, this is like saying, for you to be alive, your father needs to die first. Yeah. (laughs) Which is just fundamentally misunderstanding evolutionary theory. Oh, shit. I didn't realize there was going to be a fight to the death the day my daughter's born. I got to start working out to take this baby out. Pretty much. You've got to win that fight. Oh, because the the first time that the the first time that a kid wins a fight against you, it's all over. It's all, <laughs> it's all done. It's all downhill from there. Yeah, that's all constantly be proving how much better I am than her at stuff. Mm-hmm. That's a fact. You just gotta constantly put them in their place. Constantly. Um, I should also note that I'm not. I have no interest in having kids, and, like, the notion of taking care of kids is horrifying to me. So, like, maybe take my advice with a grain of salt. Yeah. Just a little bit. Just just a tiny bit. Like, just a tiny bit. Like, maybe a little. Maybe maybe don't listen to me for, uh, for advice on child rearing. Just a heads up. I'm going to have the if world's anyone- first infant that can solder. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Uh, so suffice to say, Mokili Membe does not align with our modern understanding of the sauropods. Uh, in fact, they, dr- they, as I mentioned before, provide, preferred dried woodlands, fed on conifers, cycads, and firmed, and moved quickly with an upright, straight-legged posture with their tails held up behind them, no dragging. Uh, not only that, but sauropods had issues with buoyancy and stability in water <laughs> based on current research. So they'd be... Oh. Terrible fucking water dwellers. Well, Kelly Membe wears water wings. Yeah. Moreover, the standard population constraints, lack of corpses, problems with the fossil record, and lack of aerial evidence all points to the creature being a huge nothing burger. Once again, however, much like the Ropin, this cryptid is fundamentally racist to me. Uh, it, it places a huge burden on the locals who are frequently indifferent or actively deny its existence. And then through one side of the mouth, the explorers and people who are believing in these creatures uh, claim that the experience of the locals indicates that there's a monster. While simultaneously, they ignore everything that they fucking say that 
disproves that belief. Um, to these explorers and cryptozoologists, these individuals are merely tools, a means to fulfill their agenda. Likewise, this particular story reinforces the old stereotypes about Africa being a primitive pr place, which, as I mentioned uh, in the previous version of this, is fucking disgusting. Uh, and even if the proponents of Mem Mokila Membe don't realize what their actions imply, it doesn't make it right. But I doubt anyone will disabuse them of their beliefs as their motives are driven by ideology that has no qualms about racism, classism, or sexism. To individuals such as William Gibbons, this is a holy war. One they're destined to lose, but a holy war all the same. And this time, I'm going to read the final thing, and hopefully a Transformer doesn't explode. Yes. Although I think at um, this point, we've, we've gone past the point of Transformer explosion. No, no, this is, this is the point that Transformer exploded last time. Oh, gotcha. All right. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from, from Gibbons. In case there is any doubt about our motivation for this work, I should tell you that we feel that the discovery of any of these creatures will be an earth-shaking event. It is our belief that eliminating common objections regarding why the Bible can't be trusted and demonstrating the historical and scientific accuracy of the scripture, so many things I could say about that, <laughs> yeah. uh, will naturally lead people to the next logical step in thinking. If the Bible is true in other respects, what does that tell us about the spiritual ramifications? When the evolution hypothesis was first proposed 150 years ago, it was with the expressed intent of destroying the church. Charles Darwin was was deeply religious and didn't didn't, didn't want to destroy the church. He, yeah, yeah, that that he people he, all the people was, don't realize that. <laughs> Scar, he was incredible. Like like Charles, like like let me like I'm like 90 percent sure the man almost was a priest. Yeah, like he. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, 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 really? Uh, yeah, he he was an uh, Orthodox Christian. Yeah, um, he was critical of it as, uh, bu -bu -bu. he was his family was traditionally non-conformist Unitarianism, which is like a whole thing, which I guess for some Christians is not really christian here's the um, thing about christians and i guess he but but here's all, the thing here's the thing they all eat all every different type of one thinks all the other different types of ones are worse or not the real type um basically by the so he by when he was uh when he originally started it he was a little bit religious and then like he yeah uh, though he thought of religion as a tribal survival strategy, Darwin was reluctant to give up his idea of God as an ultimate lawgiver. He was increasingly troubled by the problem of evil. Darwin remained close friends with the diker, biker of Down, Joan Brode Innes, and continued to play a leading part in the parish work of the church. But from around 1849, would go for a walk on Sundays while his family attended church. He considered it to be absurd to doubt that a man might be an ardent theist and evolutionist. So, like, he believed that the two things were not incompatible, but that's yeah. that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. The man, the man who you know proposed evolution, didn't think that the two things were naturally they weren't know, mutually ex exclusive from one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know whatever, whatever. That that's whatever. Um, if a wrench of this kind could be thrown into the machinery of evolution, it would go a long way towards turning people back to the only real truth the word of god fuck you gibbons yeah he's he's waging a holy war against science yeah well that's that's it that's that's yeah. like the core that's the core problem with young earth creationists is like they're waging a holy war against not even like a thing it's just a way of of analyzing data they yeah. are they are raging a holy war against a methodology. They're waging a holy war effectively against the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. Like like that's a it's equivalent. A squared kind of. plus b squared my ass. Yeah. God didn't say anything about no right triangles. Jesus didn't do trigonometry. Ma. <laughs> Sign? 
Cosine? I never read anything about any of that shit. <laughs> My, the only sign for me is the sign of the cross. <laughs> God. <laughs> Now, you listen here while I go on my tangent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, that epi- this episode's done because there's no, there's no improvement from that. That's just perfection. Oh, yes. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> um, Nothing's better than a math joke. Oh, that was a good math joke. That was a really good fun. You did two good math jokes in a row. <laughs> like, real good ones. Um, so, as always, this has been Cryptopedia. Our website is CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram is at CryptopediaCast. So is our Twitter. Um, our email is CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. We have a Patreon. And, Brandon, do you want to thank our jackalopes this week? Yes, let's thank Clay Sinclair. Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, and fuck Andrew Jackson. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, we do have a Facebook group. Just search Cryptopedia Podcast on Facebook and you should be able to find it. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, be, re- be sure to rate, review, subscribe, do whatever you can on your specific platform. Um, I know that a lot of platforms don't have rating and reviewing anymore. It's kind of weird, but whatever. Uh, if you have any monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. We're working on a few right now. Um, and also we have a Discord, which I don't think I mentioned. Did I? No, I didn't uh, mention We it. mentioned uh, that we, one exists, but we didn't mention yeah. that there, how to get to it. Yeah, there's a, there's a Discord link in the, the show notes, and that Discord is where we, that is the place that we post the most updates about what's happening, and it's more or less a direct line to both Brandon and I. Yeah, it's a direct line to us, and there, you, you can do a, have a conversation with other people about. Uh, we've got so many different channels in the Discord, so you can do yeah. But most of it's in generally anything. cursed. Yeah, most of it's in generally cursed. Where I think the most recent idea. thing was. Uh, We're talking uh, about House, House the movie. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you could find which we they, we yep. mentioned in an episode we, at some point. We mentioned it once, and it, weirdly, like we mentioned it, and then I think not too like. Within the last two or three weeks, I saw some like clips from House, and then now it's the topic of the uh, the generally cursed channel. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com, and my Twitter is at crypto brandon. On Instagram, I'm at mute twenty fifty seven. My Twitter is at jf dunham. My website is john dunham and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. And his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. <laughs>